Welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us today. This is uh, the first channel CEO uh, panel presentation. Our first segment topic or title is controversy in the channel CEO's role as the personality in chief. And so uh, I'm thrilled to be joined by three of the most innovative CEOs in the channel ecosystem today. Get Ian McCord of Zorse, get Andy Anderson of DataStream Insurance, and Damien Stevens of Servosity. And so this topic is ultra timely, uh, but it's also timeless. Uh, and that controversy and in, in the role, the channel CEO's role in, in personality in chief is uh, never ending and sometimes thankless. But um, I don't want to spend too much time butchering uh, our panelists' background. So what I'd like to do is start with Andy. If you can give us a quick overview, a uh, quick 30 seconds on your background and, and what you're doing today, and that would be most helpful. Um yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm CEO of DataStream. We're a, an insurance um, firm that focuses um, exclusively on cyber insurance. Um, and we work in partnership with folks in the channel. So, you know, making sure that managed service providers, value added resellers and other IT firms that, that really focus on the channel um, have, um, you know, a partner that, that can work and understand the insurance space um, and how that is relating to overall cyber risk programs, how it relates to the tech kind of roadmaps and and the postures that people are building up on the on the cybersecurity side. So I'm um, fun to be here and you know talk about talk about all things channel and, and what it's like to try and lead one of these companies. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. So Damien, let's 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 hear your story here real quick. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me guys. Um, so I, uh, the founder and CEO of Servocity and the quick version of my story is I was an MSP. I was trusted with backups. I was using, uh, some software, not necessarily too popular in the channel, but software that people have used for years. And it's giving me the success emails every single day. And I went to go restore my customer and the data was all corrupted. It was lying to me. It's when I learned there's a lot more to it than just getting an email. Um, there's a lot more to verification, a lot more risk you're bearing than you probably realize. So, um, so my mission is to make sure no other MSP ever goes through what I went through. Awesome. All right. And last but not least, uh, Mr. Ian. Yeah. Uh, so CEO of Zorus, um, before that, uh, I was the head of product over at, uh, Datto. I helped my older brother start the company and I uh, was there until 2018 and, I really hope I didn't build the product that caused the other person to lose data because <laughs> we send screenshot verifications by email. But anyways, um, no. uh, at Zorus, uh, we do content filtering and productivity monitoring um, and, uh, you know, channel only organization. I came from a channel only organization, so uh, I'm, uh, I really like this market and working with the, with the partners. Awesome. Well, thanks. Thanks everyone for uh, the backgrounds and kind of jump into it. We'll, we'll, we'll stick with you here, Ian. Uh, first question. So anybody that's been in the channel over the last you know few years knows that Facebook and, and Reddit, they become the megaphone for this industry, the megaphone of choice. They can be unforgiving uh, outlets when it comes to stirring controversy in the channel. And it seems like their megaphones getting louder and louder, especially with recent events, you know, with mergers and acquisitions. So, Help us dissect what's going on here. I and mean, we've got you know, these big platforms. We've got, you know, very vocal uh, audience or industry in the MSPs. Give me kind of your sense of, of just the state of the, the union when it comes to, you know, I guess, venting maybe out on, on some of these platforms. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I use all of the platforms myself. And I, I guess the way that I would describe it is if you want to talk to the techs, they're on Reddit, our MSP. Uh, if you want to talk to the business owners, they're usually on Facebook and uh, a lot of Facebook groups there. Um, I mean, I don't mind the um, the public opinion, the court of public opinion. I, I know that it can be negative. Um, and I know that, but I, I think that the longer we use social media, the more that a user can tell kind of what's FUD and what's real. Um, and you can have a productive conversation. And I, what I love about the channel is that I get, my, you know, the customers that I interact with, the partners are business owners. So uh, I like just being visible and, and talking with them. Um, and, you know, I think that that can be an area where, you know, this market specifically 
doesn't like working with some of the bigger corporations because they don't really get the opportunity to talk to executives. Um, and so I, I think it can be a positive thing. Um, I know there is negative parts of it, but uh, I think that if you're running an organization within the channel, you do need to be a part of these mediums and um, and and just have these conversations. And if it gets negative, you know, you don't interact or you know, kind of escalate. But at the same time, uh, I think that's that's where I go to find some of the the real feedback about um, the product, the solution, how it sells. And um, I, I've gotten a lot of value over over the years working at Datto and and working at Zorus too. Awesome. So, Damien, I mean, your background being both a, an MSP and a, a vendor, do you have a, any, uh, you know, being on the vendor side, I mean, do you have any kind of thoughts or has your opinion changed on kind of the, the court of public opinion? Yeah, I thought the grass would be greener, right? But it's not really the case on the vendor side. Uh, you know, I think, uh, I think there's some companies that do an excellent job of being very transparent. And there's others that haven't and still continue to not. And so I think that a court of public opinion really, you know, bears that out. Um, and so I think that's the biggest thing is we want to be transparent. Um, and I think it's easy to be transparent about your wins and not your losses. And so that's the big thing. Um, and like, you know, like Ian said, no matter what you do, somebody will be unhappy. Right? Maybe you didn't say that, but I, that's what I read into it. So there's, there's going to be FUD out there and, you know, real people will see through that. Um, but as long as you're transparent, like nobody's, no company's perfect because it's made up of people. The best companies are made up of, of great people who will make a mistake and, and just, you know, admit it, move on, let people know what's going on. It's a small world, you know, trying to cover it up does not work well. It makes it, I'm thinking of an event recently that made it onto the, uh, the RMSP Reddit that, uh, that, and so that's, you know, it's just one of those things you want to do and be very transparent about. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. So Andy, I just throw it over to you. Do you, do you, uh, do you frequent the, the sub insurance subreddits? Do you have a, uh, are you there, out mean, there incognito with a, <laughs> with a, a fake avatar and seeing what uh, people are saying? I mean, you know, we're more in kind of the tech, the MSP um, groups than we are in the insurance ones, but, but we certainly, um, you know, frequent those as well. And, you know, we, we fully recognize that insurance, um, doesn't always have the, the best reputation, right? I mean, to step out of this ecosystem. And I think social media, um, you know, it's always the extremes, you know, the, the ends of the spectrum that are typically there. And, and let's be honest, the, you know, the negative end of the spectrum um, is more engaged, you know, some people will laud it if they had a great experience, but if you had a, you know, you tell 10 people, if you had a bad experience, you might tell, tell two if you had a good one, right? Kind of. Um, and, th and then that just gets magnified um, across social media. Um, but I think the, the one, I, I think the sign of, you know, that people are engaging around these topics is a sign of how, how passionate they really are about their business and the tools that they use and, um, and how much they care about this. And, you know, and I think one of the challenges is sometimes, um, you know, the, the, reality doesn't always live up to the promise um, for what these, uh, you know, what these products have, have been, you know, said that they can do, right? And I think that that's, um, and I know I, I've been in sales and marketing roles. It's so, it's so easy to, you know, to paint the, the nice picture and it's, you know, you don't want to focus on the things that maybe are on the roadmap or not quite there yet, right? And to paper over and to, to simplify the, the vision of what these things can do. And I think the longer you're in business um, and the, the deeper the relationships that you have with customers, you realize that you have to be honest and that actually telling customers those sort of hard truths, um, you know, that that's fundamentally gonna build a relationship that is much more, um, durable and, and honest, right? And, and actually some of my, my best customer relationships have come out of those, you know, those, those times of conflict when you were willing to say, you know, we can't do this and this product isn't there yet, right? Um, and then because they know if you're always telling them good things, they're, you know, they, 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 this is not their first rodeo. They, their antennas start to go up and be like, I'm not sure I really... I really trust this person. But when you're telling them the whole truth, right, that that the difficult messages build that trust. So. 
Absolutely. So we'll, we'll stick with you here, Andy, for this, this second question. You know, you're, you're based in the Bay Area, right? And it's the epicenter of technology, and it's certainly the epicenter or filled with uh, some of the, the mega CEOs that have the mega personalities and the mega megaphones, right? Uh, you know, kind of staying on that thread, how important is it for the CEO to be out in front, you know, proactive in, in being the voice of the organization, especially out on, on some of these boards? I mean, do you, do you find that it's, it's beneficial? Do you find that it's, um, you know, is it more engaging? Does it build more customer relationships, you know, out you know, being out involved in these, in these social networks? Yeah. I mean, I think it's important, right. To, um, for the CEO to be in many cases, the public face, right. Uh, you know, I certainly find that, um, having been in different seats and in this seat, right. Just having, you know, CEO next to your um, next to your name on presentations, on, even on emails. You know, the response rates are higher, um, attention is more. Um, but I think it's really about uh, you know I see my role as as helping set sort of consistent ideals uh, and kind of core themes and messages that the whole organization has to live up to um, and to really live them every day. Right, I. I um, I was an athlete for a long time. I was a uh, relatively high level um, rower um, at both the collegiate level. And then I did a, a, some national team stuff as well. And, you know, the, the, the great coaches that I was able to work with um, in those experience. And then I, you know, I'm a student of coaches, right. You know, the, in, in, and across different organizations, you sort of see the ones and what they talk about, it's almost trite. You know, you're like the, the teamwork, the sort of consistency, the sort of alignment of ideas. If you didn't see sort of their records and weren't seeing them live up to it every day, you'd be like, this is a Disney movie or a Hallmark movie. Right. Um, but so I see my role as one. Yeah. Um, being out there and talking about it. And I think it's important for the CEO to do that, but also to use those public moments as simply a surfacing of the ideas that are, you know, going across the organization kind of at every level. Yeah, that's awesome. So Damien, I mean, do you, do you find, you know, transitioning from MSP CEO to vendor CEO, do you feel like there's a, um, you know, a, a scale as you scale, do you have to be more out front, more public, or do you, is it the inverse where if you're scaling, you have to be more kind of behind the scenes and less public persona does that does that question make sense? Yeah, I think probably a personal decision. Um, I, I think most MSPs can can sit down with their clients, right? They're usually in the same city. Most of them, you know, don't have a thousand clients or even two hundred. And so, you know, you can you can sit down with probably every client every quarter, um, and then you reach a point where you can't do that um, very quickly when you're building a vendor, not only you know face to face, but even remotely. Um, and so. You have to decide how public you want to be. And like you said, the scaling of that is different. Um, so, yeah, for me, I just want uh, the, there to be community. So a lot of people be hands down uh, and just engage in what and something else that they're doing. And others want to know more about what we're doing now and what's coming next and what are other successful MSPs learning, not only from us, but across the channel. And so being part of the community um, through the ups and the downs is is just you know where I see my role, and uh, where whether is as an MSP or like you said on the vendor side, it's still the same. Just want to be involved in it. Um, I think there's definitely a bigger need for transparency because you could just call a customer too and tell them what was going on, but if you have a big issue or a big outage or a bug or a security vulnerability or you know there's you know security is obviously a hot topic. Um, where, where do you stand on the ability to disclose those things quickly? Um, I think, you know, when Log4j being pretty recent, everybody want to know where do you stand on that? Do you have any of that? Are you impacted, right? So you need to be transparent. Um, whether it's good news or bad news, you know, here's where we stand. We do have a plan, you know, um, and I think that's what matters, um, at least for the MSPs that I want to work with. That's awesome. So, so Ian, I mean, you guys, you and, and your brother, are infamous or not infamous is probably not the right way to describe, but famous for, uh, for, uh, the data cons, right. And creating this just ecosystem of, of interaction and excitement. Do you ever feel like when you're going out to those, 
you know, massive data cons that you're like now out amongst the people and interacting. And it was like a chance to get out with the community. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that um, Austin believed in this and, and I do too, is, you know, w- one of the biggest challenges as a CEO is to be rooted in reality um, because everyone that you surround yourself and you spend so much time with your employees, you know, they're telling you the truth but they're kind of not, you know what I mean? Like they they, they work for you um, and they, you know, they've got a few other emotions that are involved and it's not that they're intentionally doing it. It's just sort of nature. Um, and so I think what's most important for me is that I'm always rooted in reality. And the only way to do that is to be listening directly to the market. It can't be what your people tell you, you have to go out and find it. And that's just one thing that you know, every other role in the organization just doesn't have that challenge like the CEO does. Um, and if you lose grip on reality, that's when you can make some really big mistakes. Um, and so, you know, when I talk to partners, I feel like I get more value out of it than they do sometimes because, um, you know, I don't have that much to tell them and I can't really, I'm not going to make a ton of decisions for them in the conversation that I'm having um, because I just have a team below me that, you know, I need to be involved if we're going to talk about like changing the roadmap or changing pricing and things like that. Um, But what I can get out of them and, and what we can talk about is the reality of what's going on in the market. How's our product doing for you and you know, what's happening in your business. And so, I, I don't post a ton. Um, I am a bit of a lurker on some of the, the social medias, but I just, I have to be there. I have to read it and I love it um, because you just get to see parts of, you know, your company that your employees wouldn't tell you or know, even know. Um, and so, you know, I think that I'm always looking at it as a way of like, how can I be rooted in reality um, and really understand what's going on um, because that's how you can find some of these bigger problems that maybe an employee might not even want to talk to you about. Um, because, you know, things just sort of, you want to kind of wipe them under the rug. And uh, those are the big problems that you want to know about. And, and it always sucks when you're CEO and you feel like, I just didn't know. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, so Damien, you touched on uh, maybe an example of, of risk, you know, and in, in just, you know, what's at stake these days. And it feels like, feels like there's a lot more at stake, right? You know, it's just collectively, there's a lot more risk. And so how do you view the, the CEO's role in, in mitigating risk between vendor and, and partner? Yeah, it's a great question. I think um, sometimes they may not want to hear it. It's not just the vendor bears all the risk and we have magical, you know, unicorn sauce and you sprinkle it over and everything's done, uh, right? It's really a partnership. So we call them partners and, and I think really it's not uncommon in the channel. So, you know, there's always risk. Players are changing, features are changing, Windows and Microsoft is almost always changing. It, the, the, you know, whatever ecosystem you're in is always changing. Whether it's vendor consolidation, whether it's security risk, there's just so many different risks. I think now a lot of people would put employee retention and or the ability to hire as a pretty big risk um, that's impacting their seat, their ability to staff their organization and to grow and to, you know, if you're too short staffed, you're not retaining people and, you know, maybe impacting your growth. So there's, there's risk that I think, you know, it was always something you, you worked on to retain and hire good people, but it's probably that one of the top risks at any growing MSP now, it really wasn't on the charts of just a, you know, year or two ago or wasn't nearly as high. So I think, you know, we usually think of risk like, what if I don't have an alternate choice to a vendor or what if I don't have, you know, if I have a security vulnerability, those are there. And as we all know, you know, even more common. So I tend to think of it as being radically transparent and then just having multiple layers, whether it's in your security stack and your ability to recruit um, in any of those layers, you want to think about how can we not be a one trick pony? How do we make sure we're investing in our team? And that's kind of our core, our, the people build the company. If we get the best people, then we will be building the best company. And um, so we invest in them first. And that's the, that's the, that's how we kind of at the base level, try to mitigate risk is make sure that we're always developing our people. And then, and that we can be in a very radical conversation about that risk with the MSP, with what they're doing with talent, security, whatever it may be, maybe disclosure to their customers, right? There's so many different topics to cover. Yeah. So, you know, so probably 
I'm gonna throw it back to Andy, who's who's probably dreaming and in, in every waking hour thinking about risk. But you know, have, have you seen kind of the dynamic between vendor and and, and partner? Do you, you see that the conversation about risk and fluidity? Do you see that increasing, getting better? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, you know, I, I think we're we're seeing an appreciation for. Um, how much of the risk is often coming not from an organization or even um, a vendor that you may realize that you use, right? I mean, I think Log4j was a perfect example. It was, you know, a vulnerability in a, an open source technology that was pretty widely used um, across, you know, so many different um, uh, software um solutions, right? And I think one of the things that, you know, kind of the core themes that I'm often talking about um, when I present um, is that I think if we're going to really be successful at, at reducing the risk, it has to be a team sport, right? And it has to be um, a team sport at a pretty um, high level in terms of an entire network of individuals. Um, and that's both individuals, companies, um, organizations that are sharing, are sharing the, the information about what they're seeing, are sharing solutions, are understanding that in some ways we are, um, we're in net war right now between the, you know, a, a, a good guy network, which is, you know, a bunch of cyber criminals and nation states that are sort of collaborating very tightly against what, you know, we can call a good guy network, which is actually multiples in terms of size, budget, um, <laughs> but the amount of um, the, the closeness um, and the interaction of the network and the, you know, how active the nodes are moving information around in that smaller you know, bad guy network, right? And again, crude terms is often, that's an advantage that they have. They're smaller, um, less well-funded, right? But they, but they collaborate better. Um, and so if we start to appreciate that and actually increase the connectivity um, of our nodes, uh, the collaboration, the sharing of data, and that's, you know, that's why we're, uh, insurance does that, right? I mean, it's a sharing of risk. It's a sharing of information. And that's why I jumped from kind of the cybersecurity space into this side it is to do that and to um, appreciate that you need others. Um, and also that, you know, the humility that likely what we will see coming is not what we expected. But if you have a bigger team that works better together, you can kind of handle most of those things, um, even if it wasn't what you expected was coming down the pike. So you're saying it's all about collaboration you know, between industry, internal with the vendor, internal with the MSP, and, and between the MSP and, and the vendor, right? Yeah, and, and to appreciate that you, <laughs> you own those um, relationships, even if you don't want to, right? That, that, you know, that you might not realize what's, that you're, you're all tied together um, uh, already. Um, and you're, you know, no one can go it alone, right? And it, that, that just doesn't, in this interconnected world, it's not how, it's not how risk works, right? No man is an island. That's it. That's it. So let's, let's pivot a little bit. Let's, let's be a little bit uh, forward thinking. So each one of you three are, are running a high velocity vendor, you know, and you benchmark your growth versus industry peers. I mean, it's, it's stellar. Uh, so, so what's next? I'll, I'll, I'll throw it over to, uh, to Ian real quick. What's next? What innovation can we expect here for the balance of 2022? Yeah, no. So, um, <clears throat> one of the, the hottest things that, uh, the converse, hottest conversations we've been having is around, um, productivity and engagement. And it's a, it's a piece of our software that, um, we ended up, you know, we built it based on a partner feedback. Um, in 2019. And with the pandemic, it just made it such a bigger topic because obviously we have much more hybrid um, and remote uh, users. And now we see MSPs are really getting, um, you know, asked by their uh, clients to say, hey, you know, do you have anything for uh, understanding how 
my employees and you know um, are using the IT stack and are doing their job. Um, and uh, and so you know we've been developing quite a few different ways of looking at it. And again, we've been moving away from saying productivity monitoring because that sounds like call center, um, you know, sort of uh, key caps and screenshots into engagement and understanding that there's um, a positive and, 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 a, and a laggard side of this and how an employee is working. And I think that managers are missing both. They're missing the part of, uh, you know, employees that aren't working as hard or engaging as hard. And they're also missing the ones that are absolutely killing it right now. Um, and because they're just not in the office. And so there's a little bit less visibility into that. And we want to solve that problem. And we want to put MSPs in the position to have these conversations and be thought leaders and be CIOs for these end clients. And I think that that's an area where it's you know unique in, in the channel to see a net new product for them to offer to their clients. Um, and I always look for those type of opportunities because I look at the MSP world and I see there's a lot of servers and a lot of hardware that's gone away in the last decade. And so that's a part of their revenue that they've lost or it's been reduced. And so looking at solutions that are net new, not just rip and replace, that's what's exciting to me uh, for the channel and, um, you know, and, and for MSPs to be able to grow like we are growing. I want to see them growing rapidly as well. Awesome. Very cool. Very cool. How about, Damien, how about you guys? What, what's, uh, what's forthcoming? What's new and exciting for 2022 for you guys? Yeah, a lot of exciting things um, really it kind of boils down to, so we have our Serocity Safe platform where we manage it for you and we continue to push the envelope on all the testing. So uh, my story was about using software that let me down and that's what led me to build Serocity. And so, um, you know, it just used to be an email and then an email and a screenshot. And, you know, we realized that's no longer enough. So we have a whole lot of automated testing and testing that makes it easier for humans to test and all sorts of people, process, and technology that come together. And then that's also expanding. It's not just servers. Now it's your 365 or maybe you're in Google Workspace. And you want to understand and validate that you can always test and have provable recovery. And so a whole lot of things where we are expanding the testing and then lastly, connecting into the systems you already have to reduce that risk of missing something, of a new user being added or a new device being added. You want to make sure it's protected no matter what make it policy driven. Um, so there's no way as you're growing your MSP and staff is so hard to find that you don't miss something that's just incredibly critical to the growth of your company, the protection of your customer and, and ultimately mitigating that risk and, and just having raving fans as customers. Awesome. Very cool. And last but not least, Andy, let's, you know, you guys have been, you've been come on the scene and, and really uh, just been, explosive growth in this in this industry what's what's next for you guys um yeah i mean i think there's a we're working on a number of things but i think there's sort of kind of three big themes um for what we're doing um you know one is about sort of connectedness right so what we're trying to do with the you know with the partners um the tech companies and the customers that we're working with is is to start to connect um into really their systems and the sources of data that they have um to do a couple of things. One, make some of the processes that they're needing to do a lot simpler, particularly around getting um, insurance coverage, right? Like right now, it's just really, we're trying to turn these complex IT systems into, you know, something that you can understand on paper. And I think that that's just a sort of a fool's errand. So we're, we're trying to go more towards the source, connect to the APIs um, to, you know, get understanding and allow us to, to really um, understand what companies are doing and ultimately to measure what their risk is, right? And to, you know, that that's very helpful in sort of in, in procuring them insurance and, and actually backstopping some of that risk um, with, with an insurance transaction um, and a policy. Um, but that also, we, we take that data and we actually are feeding it back to our partners, both MSPs and tech partners and the customers to understand how are you doing relative Right. And and, you know, with real numbers, right, um, based on uh, economic uh, metrics that we use, you know, maximum loss likelihood of having an attack. So we're we're doing those things. 
Um, and that's really fun. You know, that when, once you start gathering that data, then you can, um, you can share it with them. And often because insurance touches so many and we already through our parent, you know, touch the majority of the, the cyber insurance market, we have some of that data. So it can put people in context, right. And say, how are you really doing relative to your peers? Right. What, what's really impactful in terms of the things that you're investing in starting to give them, you know, real ROI, return on investment type numbers. Um, and then the third thing that kind of flows out of that is actually, um, you know, reduction in, um, in pricing around um, insurance um, policies and coverage, right? You know, ultimately it's about, you know, showing people where they are and bucketing them relative to their risk. So, you know, a lot is happening and, and those are happening um, you know, all, all three of those trains are kind of running um, and there are various stops along them, but making life, you know, sharing data make, to make life simpler, to show people how they're doing risk wise, and then ultimately to get them, um, you know, coverage that's, that's less expensive, um, you know, is really valuable. And so, and we've heard, heard things resonating um, out of the partner community um, from customers and, and tech firms. So I would encourage people if they've, if they've not, um, found us and chatted with us definitely, you know, and again, we're, we're building this team, right? And so it's, um, it's give, 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 um, you know, and, that, and take, you know, a tiny fraction to kind of, to cover the insurance transaction. So. That's awesome. So it's great where you can, you can wrap things up by, by saying you can help people save money and, uh, and be the hero uh, at the end of the, uh, end of the episode. But, um, if we will, we'll have links to each organization in the show notes and, and on the site. And, you know, for the for the first channel CEO episode, I, I really want to thank you three gentlemen for for joining me here. I think it's a fascinating conversation uh, about kind of the state of the union and where things are, are headed with your individual businesses. So with that, we'll we'll wrap it up. And again, thank you very much for, for joining us here. And uh, we'll see you on the next episode of the channel CEO. Thank you. This is great. Thank, thank you. you.